Thank you all. It's such a joy to be here today. Um, I would like to share with you some of the uh, backstory behind Proof of Heaven. And uh, I think um, I, m I must confess that uh, Ptolemy is the real kind of literary and academic scholar among us. I am simply the neurosurgeon who happened to have this experience. And it is one that uh, after it happened to me five years ago, uh, I was very much transformed as are many tens of thousands who have reported near-death experiences, millions of others who have had very powerful, spiritually transformative experiences, and yet my whole memory of my life before all my knowledge of brain-mind consciousness had been deleted because of this illness, this very special illness, severe bacterial meningitis, um, and a very rare form of it. And that was important that I had that deletion of all of my life before. And it gave me a near-death experience that had a few peculiarities to it, especially that I was amnesic for my life before coma, for my Eben Alexander's personal experiences, all my religious beliefs, my scientific knowledge, all that was erased deep in the middle of coma. And yet I had this profound near-death experience, spiritual journey that when I first came back was the only thing I knew was all of where I had been and the beauty of that journey, the ultra-real aspects of it. And, um, of course, my doctors had no clue how I'd come back, and they would just pat me on the back and say, well, we have no idea how you've come back. We have no idea how you could have had any experience. In fact, we have the evidence that your neocortex, the outer surface of the brain, the part that makes you human, that that was very badly damaged during this meningitis. So you can forget about all of that because the dying brain can do all kinds of tricks. Well, it turns out that I believe them. We, we tend to believe our doctors. Um, and like I said, all of my medical knowledge and, and every bit of my knowing, in fact, even my words and language had been completely wiped out by this disease. They came back rapidly as I came back, words and language came back over hours and days. Memories of my childhood uh, came back over weeks. Memories of everything I knew from 20 years experience in neurosurgery as an academic neurosurgeon took up to eight weeks to come back. And during that time, I was very busy recording all of what I remembered deep in coma. Because I figured, since my doctors told me there was no way it could have happened, but I knew it had happened, and it had to tell us something about consciousness at some deep level. And that's when I started to hit the wall, going through all of that experience and trying to bring it into focus. Um, I would like to just kind of portray the arc of that journey, tell you a little bit about who I was before. Uh, I grew up in a very scientific home. My father was an academic neurosurgeon who trained other neurosurgeons uh, in North Carolina. I'd grown up, he was very religious. He had been a combat surgeon in the Pacific in World War II, had been through a lot of hardship and difficulty in New Guinea, Philippines, on up into Japan. It was his belief in God that got him through all that in one piece. But like I said, he was very scientific. So I grew up in that home with that, that beautiful uh, juxtaposition of science and of religion. Went to a, a Methodist church as a child. But I always knew that science is the pathway to truth. I'll tell you, I'm more of a scientist now than I've ever been. But I realized that the science, what's known as reductive materialism, that I worshipped, that's our conventional scientific view, that gained so much strength in the 20th century. I now know that that science is kindergarten level. It's woefully inadequate to explain the most fundamental thing that any one of us truly knows exists. And that is our own consciousness. And it's, uh, it's important to realize the view that I had before my coma is very much a card-toting member of that uh, conventional science, reductive materialism uh, thinking, which basically says if you can understand everything about electrons, quarks, protons, atoms, molecules, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, then you can explain everything about the universe. And that science 
is a trick of smoke and mirrors because it does not tell you about one thing that I think is the most profound mystery known to all of human thought. It's something that's called the hard problem of consciousness. And if someone had asked me before my coma, what do you make of the hard problem of consciousness? I would have looked at them kind of quizzically like, well, what do you mean? I had not even really heard of it. And of course, some of my critics out there say, well, he's not even a neuroscientist. He's just a neurosurgeon. And they're right. You know, in neurosurgery, there's not a lot we need to know about consciousness. But I promise you, I've learned a tremendous amount more since my coma that happened about five years ago right now. And uh, that is where it really gets astonishing. I think that's why the book, Proof of Heaven, has gained so much ground in the scientific community. I'm getting asked to give a lot of medical talks about it. Uh, spoke at the American College of Surgeons a few weeks ago. And it's because this world is waking up. And the pure scientific materialism of the 20th century is very important. There are a lot of successes of that science. In fact, I would say I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for three very powerful antibiotics that were part of Western medicine. They helped to save my life. But as my doctors will tell you, they do nothing to help explain how I had a complete recovery. Briefly, five years ago, 4.30 in the morning, November 10th, 2008, I woke with severe back pain. And uh, soon thereafter, my younger son, Bond, those who've read the book will realize Bond is a very appropriate name for him, far more than I knew at the time. Bond came in the room, saw that his dad was in pain and uh, thought he'd make me feel better. And he came up and started rubbing my temples with his hands. And as he did that, I felt severe pain through my head. Of course, anybody with any kind of medical training would think sudden onset of severe back pain, severe headache, maybe meningitis. Well, the doctor was already out. I was gone from this world. My brain was already being overrun by a very primitive, extremely aggressive, and absolutely should have killed me, bacterial meningitis. And it was within an hour or so of that time that I had a grand mal epileptic seizure, and I was gone from this world for the next seven days. I remember nothing of it. And of course, the book does contain elements of the story that had to do with my family and all the love that they were there holding my hand 24 and seven, trying to give me an anchor to this world. And all of that I had to glean from talking with them because I knew nothing of the events during that week that I was gone. And I did find out later that I had that grand mal seizure. My family called 911. The EMTs packed me off to the hospital. Uh, the doctor there was a good friend of mine who did not even recognize me. I was so transformed. In fact, she knew when she first saw me, if she do, didn't do something right, that I wouldn't even get out of that emergency room alive. I was extremely ill. When she, suspecting men meningitis, did a lumbar puncture, put the needle in my back, out came thick white pus under pressure. She told me much later that when she saw that, she knew I was dead. Fact of the matter is, if you have a gram-negative bacterial meningitis and you go into coma in anything less than 24 hours, and I was on an express train, I took about three and a half hours to go into coma, that already takes you down to about a 10% chance of survival. That was at the beginning of the week, and it only got much worse. I did not respond to triple antibiotics. They found out the second day there was an extremely rare bacteria, E. coli, spontaneous E. coli meningitis in adults, somewhere less than one in 10 million per year. And it just got worse through the week. And by the end of that week, on day seven, my doctors knew I was down to about a 2% chance of survival. That time they said best case scenario is that he'll spend a few months in hospital, then transfer to a nursing home, round the clock care, in coma until he dies. So the recommendation on that seventh day, that Sunday morning, was to stop the antibiotics, just let nature take its course. And it was a few hours later that I actually started to come back to this world. A giant shock to my doctors and nurses. To this day, my doctors have no medical explanation for my recovery. And any doctors out there know anything about severe bacterial meningitis will agree. It's a miracle I can put two or three words together. Much less come back and write a book about it and give talks about my journey. Now, so I said, the thing that amazed me was what was in my mind when I came back. Because everything in my life before had been deleted. What did I remember when I first woke up to this world? Well, the original 
place of my journey deep in this coma was the earthworm's eye view. Very primitive, coarse, underground. I remember roots or blood vessels all around me, coarse, pounding, monotonous sound. Seemed to go on for eons. Good news is it didn't last forever. I was rescued by this slowly spinning white light with pure white and gold filaments coming off of it, and it provided a perfect musical melody. And in looking back on it, and something that guides a lot of my work and research now, melody, music, frequency, vibration provides the key to transcend in those higher and higher spiritual realms. That's why I do the work now with Sacred Acoustics, with Karen Newell, who many of you will meet this afternoon at our workshop on sacred sounds and how we use various sounds to enhance very deep transcendental meditative states. But on this journey, that melody, the musical notes, were a key to transcending up into this brilliant realm. Now, in looking back on it all, trying to analyze it, the earthworm eye view, that very coarse, primitive place where it all started, that was the best consciousness my brain could muster soaking in pus. And that's why, if you had asked me before coma, what's next? I would have said nothingness. That's where the big surprise comes in. Because what happened next is my neocortex was being destroyed by this meningitis, is the blinders came off. And this slowly spinning white light with a perfect melody coming towards me opened up like a rip in the fabric around me, leading up into this brilliant, ultra-real valley, lush, verdant, filled with life. And I had no words, no language, no body image at all. I was moving up through it because I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. Now, this was not some butterfly like an entomologist here on Earth could give you genus and species. But butterfly is the best word I have. And that, of course, as I point out in the book, Proof of Heaven, is a big problem. Is this is a journey to a place that's far more real than this world. This is the dream compared to that. And that is the eternity the dwelling place of our souls and our soul groups, our soul mates, and of our connectedness to all of consciousness beyond the bounds of this earth and to the divine, all connected through our consciousness at these deep levels. And of course, if I'd paid any attention to the near-death literature before, I would have had a glimpse of that, but I'd never paid any attention to that. I thought it was all tricks of the dying brain. Pay it no mind. Well, I can tell you that the scientist in me that before thought the brain and material realm is all that exists, that maybe at best consciousness is a, an illusion, an epiphenomenon created by the physical brain. You know, and in the height of the 20th century, psychologists were mainly functionalists and behaviorists who would tell you no one is conscious. In fact, there are still proponents of that kind of thinking today, like Daniel Dennett, who would tell you none of us are conscious. We're all zombies. I beg to differ. I think, in fact, we are all spiritual beings that are eternal, that in fact, when our brain and body dies, our soul or spirit is liberated from the shackles of the physical brain and the mind dumbed down on this side of the veil. The veil is there to prevent us from seeing that other side because it's supposed to be faith-based to some degree. And of course, we, we all have to wrestle in our own mind about what we believe about that and the evidence for it. But I can tell you the evidence from neuroscience and from consciousness studies and from the world of quantum mechanics and the physics of the very nature of underlying reality, if you look at the subatomic world, is very strong in where it tells you to go. It tells you that consciousness, soul, spirit is the thing that exists. That at the core it's all about divin divinity, that we are all divine and have that connection. Now, in this journey, with, on this butterfly wing, coming up into this verdant valley, beautiful, lush valley, flowers, blossoms, buds on trees opening up, rich textures, colors beyond the rainbow, with millions of butterflies looping in this wonderful river of life and color. And below, below us, souls dancing, lots of joy and mirth, children playing, dogs jumping. Up above, swooping orbs, golden orbs of pure spiritual beings leaving sparkling trails against a blue-black velvety sky. And chants, anthems, hymns coming down. Once again, those, that music, that beautiful, awesome music providing yet another transition, a portal up into higher and higher realms. And the best thing about that beautiful gateway realm on the butterfly wing was that I wasn't alone. 
there was a beautiful girl beside me. I'll never forget her, the way she was dressed, her smile, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones. And she never said a word, but her thoughts came straight into me. Some of the most beautiful messages of my journey. Messages for all of us. You have nothing to fear. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. There's nothing you can do wrong. Strictly in, in this realm, there's nothing we can do wrong, although given that the ascendance of our souls in that higher realm has everything to do with love, compassion, forgiveness, helping our fellow beings, not just humanity, but all of life on this earth. And we can deviate from that. We are given the gift of free will by that God, that infinite power. Because beyond that realm, those angelic choirs provided the, the portal up into higher and higher realms. Time, as we see it here, collapsing down. But deep time of the spiritual realm, a whole different causality. Far more sensible than just trying to trap ourselves in the illusion of birth to death, material realm, there's all, that's all there is. And to understand this, deep within each and every one of our consciousness, through meditation, centering prayer, the gift of death, desperation are the answers you don't have to die or almost die to get this this is all about going into our own consciousness and by being conscious beings you all have the power to do exactly this to go to these realms to come to know the infinite power of that deity who to me was so profound as I went and ascended outside of that gateway realm to something outside of all time and space in the core, infinite inky blackness, filled to overflowing with the love of the divine, infinite healing power in that unconditional love. And this brilliant orb of light, it was there kind of as a translator or an interpreter. And yet I would cycle through many, many times. And I finally then was blocked away from that region as I was told I would be. I was told I'd be going back and I'd be taught many things. I had no idea what back was back to. I'd come to believe that back was that earthworm eye view. And by spinning up the notes of the melody, that took me back into the spiritual realms. Well, it turns out that I then found that I could no longer get in there. But I came back to this world, as I describe in the book, because of love for my son. My 10-year-old son, Bond, who was there at the bedside, he'd overheard that conversation from the doctors, time to stop the antibiotics. They'd protected him from the worst news during that week, but he knew this was bad news. He'd hung around outside the room and overheard that. Came in, pulled my eyes open. I was still on the ventilator, uh, being uh, ventilated by the machine, as I had been for seven days. And he pulled my eyes open, one this way, one that way, pupils blown. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. I did not understand the words. I did not see him with my eyes or hear him with my ears. I was so far gone on my spiritual journey. But again, by being amnesic for my life before all that time, I had been fearless. That's one of the most beautiful lessons here. We can all be absolutely fearless. There's nothing to fear about death. Fear is what leads to so much of the badness in these lower realms and in the lower spiritual realms. And yet that was the reason I came back, was that sense of connectedness. My love for him is what brought me back. And then I went through a long process of trying to understand this and came to realize that deep mystery of consciousness and of quantum mechanics and of where this is all going. And the way to make sense of it was to look back over 6,000 years of human history and realize that there is a destiny coming together now. And the 20th century was a necessary sidestep. But it's now time for science and spirituality to come back together. And it is all for a reason. It's for a very important reason. It has to do with the fact that we are all connected as one. Not just all humanity, but not just all life on earth. It goes far beyond that. That's a big reason why it's happening now. But it's our connection with each other. The fact that we are stewards for this world. And it is time for a change that is inevitable. It has to do with the human spirit and spirit that we share with all of life coming together to guide us into the next level of awareness. It completely leaves behind the false definitions of dogma that says you, you're either spiritual or scientific. Those false dogmas that separate the religions because at their heart all religions get down and converge to one absolute truth about the nature of who we are. And it is time for the destiny 
that we face that's in human history over the last 6,000 years comes to a culminating point now. And it's time for that connectedness that we all share and to change this world to fully acknowledge it. And I invite you to join uh, this afternoon. Ptolemy and I will be doing a, a workshop where we'll go much more into the power and the lessons of this journey. And for right now, I want to encourage all of you to rise up and accept the glorious mission that we share to come to a much fuller vision of who we all are. Thank you very much. Thank you.